we'll be talking about how we can use OJ electron spectroscopy to analyze additive manufacturing materials. So additive manufacturing, or more commonly known as 3D printing, is a process that constructs three-dimensional objects one layer at a time. In this video, you'll see an example of how laser powder bed fusion was used at Fraunhofer in collaboration with Rolls-Royce to make an oil transfer coupling of an aircraft engine. The main advantages of additive manufacturing over traditional manufacturing technologies are its ability to form complex geometries, with intricate features, its ability to make prototypes quickly and make design changes on the fly with little to no interruption in the process, and its ability to eliminate weight from the design without compromising strength or integrity. It can be used to print a variety of materials, including metals, ceramics, thermoplastics, and biochemicals, such as those used to support bone structures. Industries that currently benefit from additive manufacturing include aerospace, where lighter parts with complex geometries uh, can be made. The automotive industry, where rapid prototyping cuts down on manufacturing time. And medical applications, where parts can be tailored to the individual patient. And industrial manufacturing, where products can be developed with designs that were previously hindered by traditional manufacturing constraints. Today, I'd like to focus on how OJ electron spectroscopy serves as a valuable tool for analyzing materials used in additive manufacturing. Specifically, I'd like to talk about three case studies where OJ was used to improve the manufacturing process. First, we will discuss a few examples of laser powder bed fusion, which we just saw a quick video demonstration of in the previous slide. And then I will move on to talk about two other examples, uh, which are emerging techniques that are in the early stages of research, electrohydrodynamic jet printing and cold spray deposition. So what makes OJ electron spectroscopy the ideal technique for analyzing these 3D printing materials? AES is extremely surface sensitive with an information depth of about two to five nanometers. Of the major surface sensitive techniques, OJ, XPS, and top SIMS, OJ has the smallest spot size, capable of elemental imaging features as small as eight, nanomet eight nanometers in resolution. In the SEM images on the bottom here, we can see examples of micro scale objects that have been made using a 3D micro printer. Obviously, the high spatial resolution capabilities of AES would be beneficial for such micro scale objects. However, even for larger scale 3D printed objects, the layer by layer nature of 3D printing inherently introduces the need for micro and nano scale chemical analysis as the need for precise control over layer thickness begins to emerge. At Physical Electronics, our latest model of OJ instrument is the 710 Multi-Technique Scanning OJ Nano Pro. Here is a photograph of what the instrument looks like from the outside with its acoustic enclosure, which serves as a vibration isolator. If you open up these doors and look inside the instrument, you'll see something similar to the photograph here on the left. The main feature, of course, is the field emission electron source and OJ electron analyzer here at the top that points straight down normal to the sample surface. And because we have the primary electrons and the analytical signal on the same axis, you can get true line of sight vision to the surface with no shadowing, making it ideal for highly topographical samples such as those uh, made in 3D printing. In addition to its primary function, the AES instrument also has several in situ attachments available. We have options to add an EDS, EBSD and backscatter detectors. We also have in situ focused ion beam, uh, FIB, you can see in this picture, available on the system. We also have other options for sample handling and manipulation, such as a parking wheel, allowing you to park up to uh, six platens in vacuum. We have a sample fracturing device that also allows for cold fracturing at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And we have a four contact stage that allows for electrical measure measurements to be made in situ.
From AES, you can get SEM images that provide high magnification visualization of the sample down to about four nanometers in spatial resolution for SEM imaging. You can also determine which elements are present on the surface and their quantity. The detection limit is about 0.1 atomic percent for most elements um, for OJ spectroscopy. We can get two-dimensional elemental distribution with elemental imaging. The elemental imaging spatial resolution is less than about eight nanometers. And we can also get chemical state information for some materials using high energy resolution analysis. Furthermore, we can sputter depth profile uh, materials to reveal, reveal thin film and interface composition and chemistry. Our base system includes a monoatomic argon ion gun that can be used for depth profiling. And we can also use the same ion gun um, for a low voltage flood gun to help mitigate charging on insulating samples. So I would now like to discuss three case studies of AES being used to analyze additive manufacturing materials. The first example I will discuss is laser powder bed fusion. So laser powder bed fusion is a method that adds successive layers of metal powder and then uses a laser to melt each layer into place on the part that's being created. In the video, we can see the process in action. A, la a layer of powder is applied to the build platform by a roller, and then a laser scans the powder layer, which causes the powder particles to melt and fuse together. This process is repeated layer by layer to form the 3D object. This method is one of the few additive manufacturing methods currently being used in production, and it's being used in fields like aerospace, uh, energy, industrial manufacturing, and to make med medical devices. Although it's already being widely used, um, it does pose several challenges. Uh, mainly being that it can include microstructural defects that could lead to cracking along grain boundaries and chemical inhomogeneity in the final 3D printed object. So in this first example, the specific material being studied here is a copper chromium zirconium mixed alloy powder. This work was done in collaboration with our colleagues at CEA Leiton in Grenoble, France. They graciously provided us with the powder material, which we then analyzed using our 710 OJ demo system here in Minnesota. So the material is expected to have um, a composition of about 0 0.3 or 0 0.03 to 0 0.3 atomic percent of zirconium, 0.5 to 1.2 uh, weight percent, I'm sorry, of chromium, and the rest is expected to be copper. The advantages of this particular alloy are that it provides both good electrical and thermal conductivity while also displaying high strength. It therefore has applications and components for nuclear fusion reactors, heat exchangers, induction coils, and rocket engine parts. So here in this picture, we can see an example of a combustion engine that was made for a rocket uh, by the company called Launcher. And this is an engine for a rocket that is designed to deliver satellites into orbit. The engine has been mostly 3D printed using this copper alloy material. So here the goal was to use OJ electron spectroscopy to look at the composition of the alloy powder. Phase segregation within the powder precursor could impact the final product, the final printed parts, and inhomogeneity within the powder particles could affect the melting temperature profile during the laser powder bed fusion process as these powders are being printed um, into a, an object. The powders were embedded in an epoxy puck and then were cross polished to expose the grain boundaries. And you can see in this optical image. Um, the powders after they have been embedded into epoxy and cross polished. The particle sizes range from about 13 to 47 microns in diameter, with the average size being about 26 microns in diameter. 
our collaborators at Lighten were interested in asking two questions. Um, the first being, is there an accumulation of chromium, zirconium of, or oxygen within the particles? And also, um, they wanted to know, is there co any correlation between particle size and chemical composition? So we began looking at the smaller particle sizes. Overall, we looked at three different sizes, kind of small, medium, and large. And I'll start out discussing the results of the smallest size particle, which is the 13 micron particle. So our original plan, as I mentioned, was to observe the cross poly section of the particles top down without any further sample prep. However, we quickly, quickly realized that the polished surface was quite rough and the grain boundaries weren't readily apparent. Um, thankfully, we do have our in-situ fib gun, so we decided to expose a cross section um, of the particles via in-situ fib cut. So here are the SEM images of the particle embedded in epoxy before the fib cut on the left, and on the right, we can see the freshly exposed fib face uh, revealing the microstructure of the particle. So if we zoom in on the fib face, we can see here in the middle SCM image that there are some regions of varying contrast, and the varying contrast is likely indicative of different grain faces. If we take a survey spectrum of this region and uh, average this region in blue, um, this is the survey spectrum. And we can see that there's about 60 atomic percent copper, 29 atomic percent carbon, and about 11 percent oxygen. So we wanted to take a closer look uh, at the chemistry of the uh, varying contrasts that we're seeing in the SCM image. So we looked at the elemental maps of the three micron field of view region of the fib face, and we see areas that correspond to high oxygen accumulation, as well as high carbon accumulation at the regions that correspond to contrast in the SCM image. We then wanted to collect a point spectrum on a high carbon region and look at the chemistry of the uh, high carbon accumulation that we're seeing in the map. So a spectrum from this point shows almost 46% carbon content, which is significantly higher than the 29% we saw on the uh, large area survey in the previous slide. This point spectrum, point spectrum also detects about 15% zirconium concentration, indicating that grain boundary diffusion of zirconium has likely occurred in this 13 micron diameter particle. Next, we moved on to our medium-sized particles. This is the average particle size, which is about 26 microns in diameter. Uh, we located one of the particles and zoomed in. And again, a fib cut was made through the center of the particle. You can see that in the SCM image. And we can see that after the fib uh, cut is made, um, looking at the fib base, we can begin to see some of the micrograin structure. If we again zoom in on the particle, we can see from the SCM image that there are varying uh, regions of varying contrast, which are likely indicative of different grain faces. And again, we took a survey averaged over this blue area on the bib face. And the spectrum from this area average shows about 79% copper, 17% oxygen, and about 5% carbon. So if we then look at the OJ elemental maps at a five micron field of view of this region, we see that there's some variation in the copper and the oxygen content between various grains. And there also appears to be some grain boundary segregation of carbon. So this was very interesting and unexpected, and we wanted to take a closer look at this grain boundary segregation. So we chose a hot spot of carbon from the five micron field of view map and zoomed into a one micron field of view uh, right on the high carbon region. And the elemental map at one micron showed that there is a low concentration of copper in the area that corresponds to a high concentration of carbon. We then dropped a point right on this carbon uh, hotspot to get a spectral analysis of the uh, high carbon region. And we can see in the point analysis that there is about 16% uh, oxygen 
and interestingly, about 5.5% nitrogen, which was unexpected for this material. So this does potentially represent a defect at the grain boundary, which could negatively affect the mechanical properties of the final printed material. So finally, we repeated this process for the largest particle size, about 47 microns in diameter. And then you can see in the SEM image on the right, the fib face that was created uh, through the center of the particle. So again, repeating this process on the largest particle size, we located regions of varying contrast in the SEM images and zoomed in to a three micron field of view. And then we collected OJ elemental maps uh, from this three micron field of view that you can see in the SEM image. We can see from the maps that there are clearly regions of high concentrations of oxygen, chromium, and zirconium that correspond to low concentrations of copper in this region. So based on this uh, um, SEM image at three micron field of view, we selected four points for AES spectral analysis. You can see the points one, two, three, and four, and the corresponding uh, spectra that were taken at each point. So for all four points, we see about one to two atomic percent nitrogen. You can see 1.8, 1.9, 1.3, and 2.6 atomic percent nitrogen. Another observation we made was points three and four were shown to contain about 9% chromium and 3% chromium respect, respect, respectively. And then finally, uh, we observed that the zirconium was, zirconium was detected in all the points at varying uh, concentrations between about 4% for zirconium and 8% for zirconium uh, variation between the points. So each of these points represents, uh, again, a defect in the material that could lead to mechanical failures once the device has been printed. Taken together, uh, we can see that there is a trend between grain boundary segregation and particle size. The smaller particle sizes exhibited the least amount of grain boundary segregation. From the elemental maps of the small particles, we can see a little bit of oxygen and, and carbon accumulating at the grain boundaries. And as we increase the particle size, there appears to be uh, much more grain boundary segregation with the largest particle size um, having a lot of oxygen, chromium, and zirconium accumulated at the grain boundaries. So future work must aim to determine the exact mechanical and electrical effects that these nanoscale precipitates may have on the printed device after the laser powder bed fusion process. So another example of laser powder bed fusion um, is shown here, and this is an example of uh, it being used to create biomedical implants. The material used uh, in implants must be highly corrosion resistant, of course, in order to prevent mechanical failure, mechanical failure as well as ion leach into the body. And then obviously the materials must also be biocompatible to prevent rejection by the body and potential metal poisoning. So cobalt chromium molybdenum has been identified as a suitable material for 3D printing artificial joints and implants. In the photographs, we can see how this cobalt chromium alloy was used to print dental implants as well as an ankle joint implant. Um, in addition to being corrosion resistant and biocompatible, it can also be polished to a, an extremely smooth surface, which makes it an ideal candidate for uh, human implants. However, few studies have been done classifying the powder particles, which like in the previous example is necessary um, if we want to understand the correlation between the raw material and the final printed part. So in the study, AES was used in a similar way as the previous example, where different particle sizes and morphologies were compared. Again, this type of analysis is suitable for AES due to the excellent spatial resolution um, that we can see in the elemental maps, as well as the coaxial analyzer geometry available on the phi instrument, which minimizes shadowing on these spherical particles. 
So here we see in the SCM image on the upper left, um, these are the powder particles. Um, we can also see a corresponding sulfur map in the upper right, where there is a strong dependence on the particle size and sulfur concentration. We can also see in the silicon map in the lower left, um, also exhibit some correlation between uh, uh, particle size and silicon concentration. And then in the color overlay in the lower right, uh, we see cobalt in green and chromium in red. And we can see that there are significant differences in the amounts of chromium and cobalt uh, on the particle surfaces. So based on a 100 micron field of view SC image taken from a different region as from the previous slide, uh, they zoomed in and selected several areas for further analysis by depth profiling. So depth profiling was conducted using the monoatomic argon ion sputtering at 2 kV. Area 1 was selected on what they are considering a small sphere. Area 2 was collected on what they are classifying as a smooth sphere. And area 3 was collected on a rough sphere. Here are the results showing the as received uh, surface spectrum from the three different areas on the left. And then the depth profiles uh, that correspond to the three areas on the right. Several observations were made based on the initial survey spectra before depth profiling. First, we can see that the surface of all three particles were found to contain carbon and oxygen. We can also see that the metallic compositions among the particles varied widely. The surface of the small sphere is composed of significantly larger atomic concentrations of chromium and cobalt. We can see chromium and cobalt signal are very high on the small sphere uh, compared to relatively smaller signals on the larger spheres. And then we can see from the depth profiles that the smallest sphere had the lowest concentration of oxygen on the surface. We can see the surface uh, oxygen content was about 20 atomic percent. Whereas on the larger spheres, we can see the surface of the particles had about 60 or, seven, uh, 60 or 70 uh, atomic percent. From the depth profiles, we can also see that for all the particles, manganese and sulfur uh, concentration decreased within the first five nanometers of sputtering, decreased to zero. And then furthermore, from the depth profiles, we can see that there are significant differences in the oxygen concentration also in the carbon concentration and uh, the silicon concentration from particle to particle. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the sputter depths reported here are based on the sputter depth of SiO or sputter rate of SiO2. So the two previous examples, um, I showed how AES can be used to characterize the raw materials used before laser powder bed fusion. So here I wanted to show an example of how AES can be used to analyze the final printed product that is printed by this laser melting technique. So here the material um, used for printing was a titanium alloy. And like in the previous examples, the application for this type of material are orthopedic and dental implants. We can see in this diagram um, kind of the process flow for creating these implants. First, there's a CT scan of the patient. A CAD file is then created based on the CT scan. And then a 3D printed implant is made using this titanium alloy um, and then implanted into the patient. So titanium is well regarded as highly biocompatible, but it has also recently been revealed that if we include beta alloys like niobium, chromium, uh, zirconium, and tantalum, it gives the implant an elastic modulus that's more like that of natural bone. However, there's little known about how including these beta alloys affect the biocompatibility. So in this study, um, titanium, niobium, zirconium, tantalum, or TNZT alloy was printed by laser melting. And then OJ was employed to determine the thickness of the oxide on the surface of the alloy under normal implantation conditions. So they wanted to look at how the material, after it is printed, um, 
and exposed to a corrosive environment, how the surface chemistry changes. So to mimic conditions of the human body, the alloy was immersed in a phosphate buffer solution at pH 7.45 at 37 degrees Celsius for 36 hours. In column A, we can see the SEM image of the as polished alloy and a depth profile extracted from the region in red. And then column B, we can see an SEM image of the material after the 36 hour PBS immersion and again, the depth profile is taken from the region in red. From the depth profile as the as uh, polished surface, um, they've reported the oxide layer thickness. If you look at the ox oxygen in blue, they've reported the oxide layer thickness to be about 10 nanometers thick. And on the PBS surface, the oxide layer is reported to be around 25 nanometers thick. So this shows that immersion of the alloy into this PBS uh, solution results in the formation of a thick, highly protective oxide layer. So taken together, this OJ depth profile data demonstrates that there is a passivation layer that forms on the alloy when it is exposed to human body conditions. And this contributes to its biocompatibility and demonstrates that um, it has potential for use in biomedical implants. So far, I have shown examples of AES analysis of materials used in laser powder bed fusion uh, manufacturing. I'd now like to shift gears and talk about a few additive manufacturing techniques that are currently being researched, the first of which being cold spray deposition. So the main mechanism, as the name cold spray implies, is metallic particles that impact a substrate and form a deposit layer without melting. So the advantage of this technique over other traditional techniques is it allows for thick layers to be grown on the order of several microns up to several centimeters. So in this study, copper particles were cold sprayed onto an aluminum substrate. Some of the challenges faced by cold spray deposition are poor adhesion strength of the particles to the substrate, and there's also a poorly understood deposition mechanism. In this diagram at the bottom, we can see one proposed uh, deposition mechanism that could lead to poor adhesion, where there is an oxide layer that remains intact at the south pole of the particles. So this phenomenon is known as the south pole problem and is recognized as one of the potential um, deposition mechanisms that would lead to poor adhesion and failure of the device. So to study the adhesion strength and the deposition mechanism, objects were made by cold spray deposition and studied using a custom instrument consisting of a high vacuum tensile testing system connected to an OJ instrument. So in this way, the adhesion strength can be determined and the fracture phase studied in OJ without breaking vacuum. So on the right side, we see SEM images at low magnification on the left and higher magnification uh, zoomed in on the right. And we can see the interface between the substrate and the deposit layer. In this high magnification image, we see an example of a gapped interface between the substrate and the particle that would cause poor adhesion. And this is the type of um, interface that they wanted to study using OJ. So in the bottom, we see a picture of the specimen that was made using cold spray deposition and used in this adhesion testing uh, data. So here are the OJ results on both the substrate surface on the top row and the deposit surface on the bottom row. We can immediately see if we compare these images that they uh, correspond to each other with a mirror image relationship. Um, what I mainly want to focus on in this slide is the oxygen map of the substrate surface. So the substrate surface has a crater, and in the oxygen map, we can see in the center of the crater that there is a relatively high oxygen level, while the outer edges of the crater are shown to have lower amounts of oxygen, and the edges of the crater are also shown to have higher amounts of aluminum and copper. So since the oxide film is destroyed on the outer edges of the crater, 
the metal of the particle substrate can bond to each other adequately, even if there is some oxide that remains in the center of the crater. So since the oxide is destroyed on the outside, that means that good bonding has occurred or adequate bonding has occurred between the metal um, and the, the deposit and the substrate, um, even with some oxide in the center of the crater. Um, the oxide that has been destroyed on the edges of the crater is enough to cause sufficient bonding. So the oxide remaining in the center of the crater is just one of three states that were, deserved on, uh, that were observed on the fractured substrate surface. And the uh, images seen in column A, we can see that the center of the crater um, has the oxide, which is what we discussed on the previous slide. And there are two other states that were observed, one being no oxide in the center of the crater, such as shown in these middle images. And the third um, state was oxide covering the entire crater, which is, can be seen here on the right. So an oxide in the center of the crater corresponds the, to the deposition behavior where a single cold spray particle has perpendicularly uh, impacted the flat substrate. And like we discussed, this results in adequate adhesion. In contrast, um, we have some craters that had almost no oxide remaining. This allows the uh, copper to fully bond with the substrate, resulting in strong adhesion. So oxide removal is thought to occur here uh, in two ways. The first way is by irregularly shaped particles, which um, hit the substrate and allow the stress to concentrate right at the center point of collision and help break up that oxide. The second way that oxide could be removed in this uh, scenario is by multiple collisions of particles uh, forming an irregularly shaped crater. The oxide film um, could maybe not be removed by a single impact, but could be removed entirely by the assistance of multiple collisions within the same crater. Poor adhesion occurs uh, when craters are entirely covered in oxide, such as um, this column here on the right. Because this was often found in the case of small diameter particles, uh, creating small diameter craters, we can assume that the kinetic energy um, at the impact, incident impact, was not high enough to fully remove this oxide film from the substrate, which would cause poor adhesion. So like cold spray deposition, um, another deposition mechanism is electrohydrodynamic jet printing. And it's a completely new additive manufacturing technique that has recently been gaining a lot of research traction. So electrohydrodynamic jet printing or e-jet printing is an emerging technique that has several advantages over other established uh, traditional techniques. So this technique utilizes a very small jet diameter, less than a micron, which gives it very precise ink flow and high resolution printing capabilities down to about 30 nanometer feature sizes. It also offers the advantage of being able to print on non-planar and or flexible surfaces. So the way this works is by using an applied electrical field to pull ink out of a conductive nozzle forming this Taylor cone. One of the advantages associated with the, I'm sorry, one of the challenges associated with this technique, however, is the limited number of available ink compositions um, that are compatible with this printing method. So in this study, the limitations um, in the amount of e-jet printing ink were offset by coupling it with the complementary deposition process. Area Selective Atomic Layer Deposition, or ALD, is a vapor phase thin film deposition technique and enables the coating of high aspect, high aspect ratio structures with sub-nanometer precision. So typical ALD growth conditions usually lead to uniform coverage of a blanket film over a substrate surface. And then there are additional uh, subsequent patterning steps that are needed in order to create uh, area selectivity. So here, e-jet printing is combined with ALD. So e-jet printing is used to print patterns of polyvinyl pyrrolidone, PVP, 
and the PVP regions are chemically inert to the ALD precursor and can be printed to a pattern with submicron precision. So then deposition via ALD is carried out, which allows for tuning of material composition and thickness with sub-nanometer precision. So to characterize this printed surface, AES was utilized because of its high spatial resolution, uh, detection limit, and elemental quantification capabilities. So here are the AES results of the E-JET and ALD printed patterns. On the top left, we see a line scan after zinc oxide ALD on PVP. The line scan was taken from the region uh, shown in the SEM image seen here in figure B, this dotted line. And here we can see in the SEM image, the squares are lines of printed PVP. We can see in the line scan that high uh, carbon corresponds to low zinc and oxygen which demonstrates that inhibition of ALD has occurred in the PVP area. Images C and D are the co corresponding AES maps from this SCM image seen in figure B. The carbon and zinc maps demonstrate selective growth of zinc in the non-PVP regions. And then figures E through H show lines of a 312 nanometer wide PVP line that was successfully, um, that successfully inhibited growth of zinc and aluminum. And then the line width here, um, the resolution of the line width is about two orders of magnitude higher than previous reports of devices that have been made using ALD and traditional inkjet printing. So clearly the high resolution chemical mapping functionality of OJ was needed to characterize these surfaces. So in addition to additive manufacturing, this method of e-jet printing combined with ALD can also be used for subtractive printing to generate inverse patterns and ultimately build a 3D uh, printed device. This is first done by spin coating a polymer onto the silicon surface. Then the e-jet printing ink is used as a solvent to dissolve away selective areas of the polymer to create a pattern. So when used in combination, the EJET ALD techniques enable 3D devices to be constructed with precise control of geometry. So to demonstrate the potential of using EJET ink as a solvent to generate inverse patterns, um, a spin-coated PMMA surface was created, and then N-methyl-2-pyrrolidone, or NMP, was used as the solvent ink. This results in localized dissolution of the PMMA exposing the underlying silicon surface, um, which then can be backfilled with ALD. And then OJ was used to characterize the pattern surface. And here are the results. The top series of images shows the results of aluminum doped zinc oxide, AZO, deposition on PMMA after 10 ALD super cycles, which corresponds to a thickness of about 20 nanometers. And the bottom series of images shows the results of zinc 10 oxide ZTO deposition after 100 ALD super cycles corresponding to a thickness of about 25 nanometers. So the line scans are taken from the regions um, indicated by the dotted lines in the SCM images and show that only carbon and oxygen are detected on the unprinted PMMA surface demonstrating that the printed PMMA has successfully inhibited metal deposition in these regions. In the AES elemental maps, we can see that in the case of AZO deposition, uh, the zinc and aluminum signals are only observed within the printed regions. Similarly, in the case of ZTO deposition, we can see in the elemental maps that only zinc and tin are deposited in the printed regions. So these results, which are made possible by the high spatial resolution elemental mapping capabilities of AES, demonstrate selective patterning of these metal oxide films. So in conclusion today, I have discussed how OJ electron spectroscopy provides chemical characterization of surfaces with high spatial resolution elemental mapping, making it an ideal technique for analyzing these additive manufacturing materials. 
The unique coaxial geometry available on the 710 instrument also makes it ideal for surfaces with high topography, such as those in 3D printed objects. Uh, we discussed how laser powder bed fusion is an established technique that relies on high quality of raw powder materials. An OJ can be used to study grain boundary diffusion and inclusions that could affect the final uh, printed material. AES has also been used to study new or emerging uh, additive manufacturing techniques, such as cold spray deposition and electrohydrodynamic jet printing for process validation and to shed light into the deposition mechanism.